Discord. I think it's hilarious, Tom, that you want to do this, but I get it. If people are listening in the car, I get it. Go for it. This week's guest is Ron Butler, and we had such an amazing conversation with him. If you haven't already checked out his Angry Mortgage podcast, I highly recommend you do after you watch this episode. Just wanted to give you a heads up that there are more swear words in this episode than a <laughs> typical episode of the Tom Story Show, and that's who Ron is, and we appreciate it, and it's great. Just in case you're listening with kids in the car today or wherever you're watching this, just wanted to give you a heads up. Enjoy this episode because it's a good one. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. Fun. Great. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Tom Story Show. This is episode 101. Thank you for being here. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and join our community and like this video. If you're listening on the audio platforms, I hope you are having a great day. Today's guest, we've had a lot of people tell us in our comment section that, that you want him to come on the show, and we got him. Ron Butler has joined us today from Butler Mortgages. He's got the Angry Mortgage Podcast. 30 plus years in the mortgage industry, over 60,000 followers on his Twitter account. And he's here today to talk about Canadian real estate. And we're going to get to the bottom of every single issue. Ron, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. By the way, I've got 53,000 followers on TikTok, all platforms. I have 153,000 followers. So there you go. Right. Did you ever think this was going to happen 30 years ago when you got into mortgages six, that you'd be... I'm 66 for fuck's sakes. Okay? <laughs> like, I am the most unlikely motherfucker to have 150,000 followers on the face of the earth. Okay? Are you getting like, stopped it, on the street now? Are people stopping you like, you're the mortgage guy? It's weird, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to this uh, Ottawa conference and I'm in the... Uh, I'm putting my bags through the security to fly to Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And a young guy who's in the actual security guy outfit says... Hey, I know you. I want your channel. <laughs> <laughs> then the security guy. What is a is he part time realtor? Like I think yeah, this is weird. And then I, as I'm in, as I'm in the boarding to, for the gate, this woman with a tiny baby. She's in her thirties with a tiny, like a really fresh baby. Okay, and it looks like she's almost getting ready to breastfeed the baby, which is great. But she says, "Hey, you're Ron Mortgage guy." <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, thanks for watching. <laughs> like it, it's weird. Like I'm telling you, it's weird. I'm accosted in the grocery store about every second time in the grocery really? store. Really? Hey, you're a mortgage guy, aren't you? I don't know. I don't know. And, you know what? And, it, you know the depressing concept behind that? It's way too many people interested in real estate in Canada. Way <laughs> too many. Because <laughs> they're watching what you say and, and they like what you say. And it's interesting because you've got the big following on Twitter. I, I would guess that's kind of where this all started. Then you've started taken it over. Then taking it over to TikTok and who knows what's going to happen with TikTok. There's all these new legislative things. They could disappear one day. But then you've taken it over to and you're one of the only people I've seen successfully go from Twitter to YouTube and everyone followed you. So, you know, not to kiss your ass too much, but you've done a great job because it's very hard for people to get people to follow them over onto different platforms. Very hard. Like Instagram is a struggle. Like yeah. Instagram wants to struggle. I think, you know, you just need to be an Instagram person from years ago. And certainly I was not like, I, I, I just fell into Twitter accidentally. And then, you know, because I'm a loud mouth. I mean, I said a lot of shit and people started following and then took an interest. I was actually one of my staff members begged me to go on YouTube was well, somebody who works for me. She begged me to go on YouTube. My producer, Jessica, she begged me and begged mm -hmm. me to ask, but fucking stupid. I don't want to fucking do that stupid. <laughs> and some people in the industry started asking me. So I started YouTube. And immediately as I was on YouTube, she said, now you got to go on TikTok. I said, what the fuck? No, TikTok, I'm not dancing. Fuck, it's just crazy to be on TikTok. It makes no sense. So she, you got to do it. You got to do it. So she actually sounds like that. And uh, so finally I did it and the rest is history. But I am the most unlikely person to be in social media. Like um, it doesn't make any sense at all. But here we are. Well, I'll say on behalf of everyone that, that follows you and watches your videos, we're thankful that you did end up doing it because I think people really love to hear what you say and, and you're unfiltered, which I think is awesome about the market and what's going on. On, on all the social media side of things, obviously you, know, you, own, you own a mortgage company as well. So has Actually, it? I, I don't own a mortgage company. My family owns it. Gotcha. I'm, okay. Sorry. 
they're too, too irresponsible to own shares. But go ahead. <laughs> okay. But your name is on a mortgage company from all well, these I, people. I, I gave, I, I caused the birth of the other people involved. Okay. And uh, yeah. so there you go. Fair enough. Uh, is it turning into like you're generating all these opportunities for your mortgage company because of the platform you've built on the internet as well? Are you getting a lot of people coming into you? I know you've always you've always been one of the ones with the absolute best rates out there, but is that now bringing in even more than you've ever dealt with before, like volume wise? Well, you know, volume is so far down from 2021 for everybody, every, right. you know, everybody alive in the real estate and mortgage business. Volume is so far down. You talk to the lenders, they're still saying, oh, yeah, volume so far down. Uh, so, you know, but is it, do we get leads for social media? Absolutely. We get leads for social media. And so, and, uh, Rob McClister posted an interesting, um, post today where he talked about the fact that based on algorithm change and the introduction of AI that, you know, Google, uh, the traditional Google pay-per-click mm -hmm. kind of work is doomed. It's mm. just doomed. Okay. Um, and I've, the people I talk to in the um, in that world say the same thing. Like off the record, I mean, if they're selling it, they're saying, "Oh, it's great still," but you get a few drinks out of them, and they say, "No, nah, we're fucked. We're doomed. We gotta get out of it." Uh, so that's sort of the future. The people, you know, the big banks depend on um, on Google for a lot of the you yeah. know, for tracking their for their referral to their websites. But yeah, it it's probably going to die because we, you know. People get their information on social media now, just more and more and more. And that there's no likely no end to that trend. Uh, it's you could make an argument that Pierre Paulia was going to be the next prime minister of this country, mainly from social media. Because yeah. when he talks to old media, he just tells them to fuck themselves. Okay. <laughs> like universally, consistently, and always he tells them to fuck themselves. Like right up in the right in the scrum, like he said, that's a stupid question. Okay, to the people from CBC, so um, they're all in on social media, and he's going to be the next prime minister. So it's 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 changing. Like the idea of being uh, doing a lot of website optimization or pay per click or any of that right. stuff, it's probably doomed. It's going to be you know in the next three years, it's going to be all content, and and that'll be that. So. And do you think the the big banks are falling behind on this? Because I know they have rules in place where they don't even want their people to go onto social media. Or if you do, you have to go through like six months of approvals and all this craziness where you can go on and say whatever you want and you've gaining this advantage. Uh, do you think they're just going to fall further behind? Because And, and let, let's be real too. When they do start actually doing it, it's going to be a very conservative, buttoned up version of the information being put out there, right? Which people don't necessarily relate with as much. So I've been dealing with big banks for the best part of 20 years and, and other big lenders. And I will tell you this, uh, they're very, very, very fucking rich and successful. Hmm. And when they, sure, the, you know, they can't do guerrilla advertising like I'm doing. They can't go on and, you know, uh, TikTok and say, yeah, fuck these people, fuck those people. They can't do that, but when they turn their mind to something, they have so much money, right? Okay. They, they, you know, if people are constantly, people are constantly thinking that, oh, well, we're, we're smarter than the big banks and we're more nimble, like realtors and mortgage brokers are much, much more nimble than, you know, they're much more creative than the big banks. And that's why we exist. Right. Why, why else would mortgage workers exist except we bring something to the table? Right. Um, so, but in terms of when they put their mind to something, like it took them 10 years. Like we, as mortgage brokers, we led on, we, we as an industry led on rates for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And then the banks finally got tired of it. And they can, they cut rates and they can be as aggressive on rates. They'll put mortgage brokers into the dirt if they want to on a file. Okay. So you guys are in the real estate business. You know that, you know, you know, that there's times when the bank reps will just slaughter the mortgage broker. Okay. That never happened six years ago, five years ago, hardly mm -hmm. ever happened. Now it does. So, um, the, you know, they're the richest and like, when you talk to the people at the top, yeah, like maybe some of the customer service reps in the branch are not necessarily the finest minds or, you know, some of the mortgage aid reps and the mortgage reps, some of them are brilliant. 
some of them are not that bright, but <laughs> when you talk to the people at the top of the bank, fuck me, they're smart. Yeah. You know, they're really smart. And, and there's a reason, you know, and it, when they put their mind to something, they will fuck you up. Okay. So I don't, I don't, uh, I, you know, th- but it takes some time. It take, they're big, they're huge. So it takes some time to do something. So that's my thoughts on that. I mean, I think they'll be there. Like they're there on rates, they're there on digital, sort of. Um, and, you know, we, we also have discovered that in terms of real estate and in terms of mortgage brokering or mortgage sales, that people prefer people. Like, because mm-hmm. you, know, you tell me, how did, did did Zillow and Redfin take over the world? Okay. I mean, like, uh, did they? <clears throat> Fuck no. <laughs> All right. So we got the same thing in our business. We got a company called Nesto. We got a company called Pine. Uh, they got millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of venture capital backing. And, and are just- they... Ron, are those companies, are they trying to sell leads back to you or are they actually a brokerage? No, no, no. they're not lead generators. The lead generators are dying too. Like okay. the Google, like the Google's destroying lead generators. Uh, but the, um, like the algorithm changes in Google are destroying the lead generators. But the truth is that these are direct to consumer companies. These are companies that, you know, either in the case of Nesto, they became a CMHC NHA lender so they can directly access the capital markets. Um, they have, they spent, millions and millions and millions of dollars on digital applications, um, you know, digital processing, everything else, abject failure, like mm. just pathetic abject failure. If they weren't backed up by the Demery family out of Montreal or some of the richest people in Canada, uh, they would have closed. Okay. They burned through like $180 million. Okay. Private companies. So they can deny it, but why do you think, think they failed? Well, because they, because here's the deal. Why did Zillow, Zillow fail? Like, why did Redfin fail? Like, what? Like, are they, are the people behind those companies brilliant real estate operators? Did, did they have, you know, the stuff you guys do every day, were they brilliant uh, in terms of where the market is, what people react to, uh, how do I get a deal done? Were they brilliant at that? Were any of the leadership of, of those digital companies brilliant at that thing? Okay. Not usually. Not usually. No, I'm going to take a different perspective. They okay. were all fucking terrible at it. Like <laughs> fucking didn't know a fucking thing about it. Horrible. The ones they recruited from the real industry were failures already. Okay. And and pieces of shit. Okay. So that was a total failure because this, as you know, in the real estate side, as I know on the mortgage worker side, this is an operations business. This is a, I have to find the right answer for the client. I have to find the right house for the client. I have to find the right deal for the client. I have to do the right thing for the client. Whereas these tech people just think, you know, if I build a better app, everybody's going to come and suck my dick. Okay. So, you know, th- th- that, which is crazy. Like it's absolutely yeah. crazy. But some of them come from a background of inventing a new pay system. Like, hey, I can speed up the movement of money from Visa to the consumer this much faster and I can sell that for a few million dollars, like $100 million, I'll get rich. The mortgage business is an individual, one deal at a time business. The real estate business is a one yeah. house, one condo, one strata at a time goddamn business, okay? It's human beings making human decisions. And most importantly, are people buying houses every three months? Not usually. Well, so you say to yourself, okay, what do people really understand well in digital? They understand if they're stock trading on, on TD Waterhouse or something, they understand that very well because they're looking every single day. They're looking every day at the risk. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? If you're doing travel online, you're probably booking something every three or four months so you have strong familiarity with it, okay? If you think of all, all these different elements where different kinds of digital situations where there's a consistent pattern of use and familiarity, okay? You buy a house every five years, three years, seven years, eight years. How the fuck are you familiar with? It? You're right. not familiar. And you want somebody to take you through the process. You you don't feel any comfort with digital because the minute uh, with the digital and real estate, the minute you try to ask the, the chat bot a question, they say, uh, well, I'm in the Philippines. I don't know anything what you're talking about. Okay. So you're doomed right from the start. And that's why the frequency of use which is extremely infrequent in real estate and mortgage. 
Like if you're renewing, it's once every three years, once every five years, whatever. The infrequency means no one's ever comfortable with pure digital. Right. They never will. Be. Now, I'm not saying that AI won't change that. It could. But right now, no. All these, just as in real estate, the so-called prop tech companies failed almost universally or just are sort of just information sites now, okay? Selling leads, okay? But they, they can't do the job and neither can the mortgage companies. So we, like I said, we have digital people. We have people who were given millions and millions because it was an easy pitch to venture capitalists. You go to a venture capitalist to say, you know, I think the banks are stupid and slow. Wouldn't you agree? So if I got a better digital application, people are going to get their mortgages from us. Sounds good, right? Mm -hmm. And these poor venture capitalists said, yeah, 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 sounds good. And they rained down money on these companies and they all failed. Mm -hmm. They all failed wholly. Okay. And you see it time and time again in real estate you know, as you know, well. Say, here's, here's what you know. If you hear the word pivot, you know, you've heard that <laughs> word pivot before out of a uh, out of a digital company, right? We're going to pivot now. Pivot in the Californian language means we have to go with a new lie. That's what that word <laughs> means. Okay. Because whatever the fuck lie we were telling you before venture capitalist isn't working. So we're going to pivot and tell you a new lie so you won't shut us down. Okay. So that's what's happening. What I've and there's another my, yeah. there's another layer on top of that, which is you're not selling the same product every single time. And that's what a lot of people lose, right? When like we have I have a friend that's in the tech space in real estate and he very much thinks that realtors will be gone one day. And I'm like, but nobody's in that home with that person and that particular like, is that a nineteen fifties bungalow with an oil tank or is that some, like the product is never the same thing twice and people are not going to rely on a computer algorithm to get it right when it's their million, $2 million on the table. I just don't think it's ever going to happen. You need a, now, th th there will be changes though, just like there's being changes in the mortgage brokerage industry where on average mortgage brokers are working for less pay than they mm. were five years ago. As a group, they're all working for less pay. In the future, if this, the, the, by the way, the, this woman was a very bright, bright woman who was speaking at this real estate conference from the States, as she said, the Department of Justice has taken an interest in real estate commissions in the US. Yeah. There was like a 10 yeah. year moratorium on their being interested. They tried to get interested 10 years ago. There was some legislation which held them back for 10 years, but now they're interested again. Now that might change. Could be a new president in, in you know, eight months, but. But the reality is, if the Department of Justice is interested in unraveling real estate commissions because they feel it's too high, and she went through what she thought would happen. She said, here's what's going to happen. This episode of The Tom Story Show is brought to you by Realty Ninja. Hey, real estate agents, I bet you didn't get into the real estate industry to try to become a web developer. Realty Ninja will help you build a beautiful website for your business without becoming all techie, because me and Steve are certainly not techie. They'll set up your entire site for you. They'll migrate the content from your current site and they'll take care of all the back end, switching the domains, all the things that you don't want to do, they'll take care of for you. Their team of in-house designers will make your new site match your current brand and help you stand out from your competitors. Best of all, Realty Ninja offers a free unlimited trial that lets you build out your website and they do not charge you until you're ready to launch. That's right, they are so confident in their product and that you're going to love the website that you build with them. They will not charge you until it's ready to launch. They don't even take your credit card details. Listeners of the Tom Story Show will not only get an unlimited trial before you launch, but if you go to RealtyNinja.com slash Tom, you will get 20% off your first year after you launch. A beautiful, functional, and professional website is absolutely a must in today's real estate landscape, and Realty Ninja delivers. So go to RealtyNinja.com slash Tom for 20% off your first year. That's RealtyNinja.com slash Tom. And now, back to the podcast. Uh, it's going to become disjointed. You're going to have to, particularly buyer's agents, yeah. are going to have to ask buyers for fee for service. Yep. And if you have to ask buyers for fee for service, Boom, it's competitive overnight, automatically competitive. Now, you notice we're not saying for sale by owner. That's stupid, okay? Or any of that. So, and even the selling agent's going to be, okay, so you're just going to be the listing person. Uh, so, you know, we're not paying the buyer's agent anymore. So 
We have to think that through, but the buyer stage, the buyer stage is going to be hugely impacted. Okay. Um, it, it could be fee for service. Hey, you want me to take you to a house? You want me to negotiate for you? They're all separate fees. Okay. And as we know, as soon as you get into the fee business, you're now in the price comparison business. Okay. That's just the way it is. So, uh, so she was very smart and told a lot of good information about it. So that what got me to thinking, but to your point, is it going to eliminate real estate agents and mortgage brokers? Unlikely. Okay. But will we make less money per transaction? Maybe, Maybe so. Maybe so. And do you think half of them will finally get out of the industry? Like we've all saying will eventually happen if things change, but everyone, even now, like, you know, we went through the last few years and people that held their license changed a little bit. Like I think Treb officially went down for the first time in a long time. Yeah. But yeah. half the industry didn't leave. They, they might not be waking up every morning and trying anymore, but they're still holding their license. Have, have you found that in the mortgage space as well? Or are people just saying, okay, never mind, I can go do something else? Well, the, you know, the mortgage space is the cheapest um, license and the lowest barrier to entry of any quote unquote profession in Canada. Hmm. Okay, so if you want to maintain a license, you probably only have to pay out about $1,600 a year. Okay, maybe 17. Um, that's it. Mm-hmm. And you, the, the course, the, you know, to get you to become a, a level one licensed agent in Ontario, it's far less than BC. It's far less effort and, and time span. Um, so it's very inexpensive. I, I don't know how that's going to work out. I mean, I guess if some people go two full years without ever doing one deal or one end, I mean, they're probably going to say, I don't want to pay a cent anymore. Right. But, uh, yeah, so far there's it's like Treb is down a bit, but not a lot, and we're gonna know a lot more in one month. This when all of the Ontario mortgage licenses renewed, yeah. uh, but so far the expectation so far is that it will not be like a thirty or forty percent drop. That it won't be anything like that. So now staying on the mortgage side of things, we got to ask a question that I know you've been very vocal about on Twitter. Uh, did lots of research coming into this conversation with you. Um, I just, I mean, I know you're going to give us the unfiltered answer, but like, is mortgage fraud as big of an issue as we seem to think it is on the internet, on the comments? Like you're seeing applications, like how bad is it really? If I'm, if I'm a first time home buyer and I'm bidding on a, you know, the first condo I want to buy, am I up against someone who has fraudulent applications and that's not fair and that's going to impact me directly, which will then push up prices. Like how much is this actually happening? Is this a huge issue? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's let's face it; it's it's extremely regional. The amount of mortgage fraud in Saskatchewan and Manitoba is virtually non-existent. The amount of mortgage fraud in the Maritimes is less than one percent. Um, by the way, you're supposed to say Atlantic now. These guys, the girls, chasing me. You got, can't say here. <laughs> so, and then, so we've got whole provinces, whole whole parts of the country where mortgage fraud doesn't exist. Mortgage fraud is regional, okay? And it, it's, it's basically in big cities. You know, it's basically, it's in um, it's in greater, greater Vancouver, it's in the GTA, it's in Calgary to a little, in a little bit, and a little bit in Montreal, okay? So it's regional. Uh, and, and therefore, if we're living in those regions, okay, we think, holy shit, there's a mountain of it, okay? But if we're not in those regions, right. they wonder what we're talking about. Like, And that's true, and that's statistically true. So they don't talk about this anymore because, you know, it's viewed as discriminatory. But I attended a meeting where the second biggest board insurer in Canada at the time, uh, it was eight years ago, put up a chart and said, there's more mortgage fraud in two towns in Canada than there is in all other provinces and territories combined. Wow. Okay. So it's regional. And is it serious? Sure. I mean, but we found out through Sam Cooper uh, two weeks ago that, you know, you could have just bank representatives doing mortgage fraud at HSBC. Like, hey, we're just so you're a part-time hairstylist here in Canada, but in Shanghai, you're still maintaining your $780,000 salary job. Okay, sounds good. How many houses do you want to buy? Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, 
don't get me wrong. The, the Harvey C's takeover means that that's not going to happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not going to happen in that way, in that particular way. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, sure it exists and you guys know this you're in the business. So you understand this clearly. The marginal buyer creates the price, mm -hmm. right? True. False. Yes. And seller. Both. But if, but, a, if a seller is desperate, a buyer, right? There has to be a buyer. There's yep. no transaction without a buyer. You could list the property for two years if there's no True. buyer. You know? So the marginal buyer sets the price. If the marginal buyer is influenced by either mortgage fraud, mortgage income document fraud, or by uh, foreign money or malaudered money, hmm. then that detaches them from normal people earning normal incomes trying to buy a house and that impacts on markets. I think that's a fair statement, isn't it? I think so too. So how do we like, and when we say the word mortgage fraud, does that mean people trying to use fraudulent paperwork that get caught and it goes no further or slips through the system and actually gets into buying a house? And there's all these people that maybe are buying things they, they shouldn't even be able to afford because of the fake documents. Like, I guess it, it encompasses everything, but the ones that actually slip through, like what happens on the mortgage brokerage side, if you get documents that you believe are fake, do you guys have to go give them to somebody and say, hey, I believe this person is is lying to us? I, I, no, we just, if, if we identify uh, fake documents, we just cancel the file. There's nobody to go to. There's mm -hmm. absolutely nobody to go to. You can't, uh, the provincial regulator is not what? empowered to look at those documents. Um, is that a privacy thing? Uh, no, it's just that's that's not part of their purview. Okay, they they need they need to be, they need the somebody submits what you think are false documents. That's just your opinion. Now, sure. obviously, I know they're fake. Okay, I know they're fake, so I'm saying no, you're declined. But I'm not allowed. There is a privacy context, and there's also I, you know, I can't until we have CRA linkage, so that CRA decides whether this document is real or fake. Um, I don't have any compelling proof i just look at it and say like you know you, like you missed a bunch of stuff on this document right you screwed it up uh so i don't have but i that i can't take that to a cop cops won't even pursue it anyway this yeah. is what the cop said this is what a cop will say a cop will say well did they get the mortgage no they didn't why are you here get out right okay. there's no damages there has been no damages there's no losses so and which brings up the big big problem with mortgage fraud from law from Justice's point of view, from the criminal justice system's point of view, if there are no losses, mm -hmm. we're not investigating. So if these people have made all their mortgage payments on the screws, like they haven't missed a single payment, why are you here? Get out. Oh. Okay. Yeah. There's no losses. Like we'd only pursue losses in the police business. That's all we fraud do. Has, fraud has not <laughs> caused any damage by you know, something that's tangible, if somebody, a uh, bank or an institution or, or a private lender even getting screwed over, there's no one to pursue. No, Do no, you if, if you engage in fraud for profit, like if you engage in, in identity theft, so that you're trying to get a mortgage on a, on a property you don't really own, the police will go all, come at you like full force. Like you, yeah. you, they will get, catch you. They will charge you. They will do, they will go after you. But if you used fake income documents to qualify for a mortgage, and you never missed a payment, there's no loss, right? Yeah. There's no loss. So yeah. do, do you think that possibly, so uh, I was speaking with a, a, a bank rep this week, a guy I've sent business to for 15 years. And um, he said, it's almost like they're not trying to hide it anymore. Like the, the documents he's getting now are so easily identifiable as being doctored that he feels like come on at least give it a shot guys like try and fool me the guy looking at your documents do you think the cbc mortgage fraud uh investigation what was that came out a year ago year and a half ago whatever that was do you think it's that maybe even a year and a half yeah yeah so maybe even that enabled people even more because like one of the things that we saw um we haven't seen it but one of the, the thoughts that went through my brain is in bc we have training for um, money laundering, how to identify money laundering in the real estate business. And after taking that course, 
I knew exactly how to launder money in the real estate business. Before taking that course, I had no idea. So do you think shedding that light on it has now maybe possibly made the problem even worse? So prevention courses are actually training courses and how to do fraud. Okay, or money laundering. I, I get your point. But uh, look, uh, if you're seeing, if you're, if you, if a if a bank rep is seeing documents that he thinks are laughably amateurish, it's just the source is laughably amateurish. So in in both cities, and I think it operates in Calgary as well, but certainly in the GTA and Greater Vancouver, there are full fledged <laughs> businesses that do this. There are companies that start. They'll start a new dummy company, like they'll start mm-hmm. a corporate company and they'll actually age it for 18 months. They'll mm-hmm. create a website. They'll create ongoing timely activities on the website. So there's new reviews being posted every little while. There's new blogs being posted on the website of this business, this fake business. Okay. And there's a management team and there's names and there's phone numbers that it, they, they season it for like 18 months and then they start doing fraud with it. They produce perfect documents because Adobe can produce perfect documents. Okay. So they produce perfect documents, T4s, doses of assessment, hate like automated ADP or certain payroll documents. Uh, and they're perfect. And when the lender phones, the, the fake company that has a website, there's somebody who's set aside because they only activate this for the fraud after 18 months. Right? So they know it's only got about six weeks of life till it's caught. So they'll staff the phones for six weeks. You'll get a receptionist who says, hi, uh, fraud company here. And uh, how can I help you? And the, the bank will say, well, I need to speak to the HR person. Here's their name. Oh, one moment for the HR manager. And they'll put you through to a different voice, all a scam, all a boiler room. Okay. And that HR manager will know exactly how to respond in the perfect way. What do you do with that? Like you got perfect documents and you've got all the checking systems in place. Now, I know when banks get suspicious, they'll actually have somebody drive out to the address and figure out whether this is bullshit or not, okay? But it, but for a few weeks or months, it works. And then they'll pull off, that fake organization will pull off 40 or 50 mortgages, maybe less, but they'll make sure they spread it out between different banks. So there's a timeline on when they get caught. But they've already, they have another company ready to go that's been seasoning for 18 months again. It's a cycle, okay? These are professional people. Because actually, if you think about it, in some cases, the realtor, who's typically the the kingpin is the realtor who's organizing this, as you noticed from the the Marketplace documentary. Um, Typically, the realtor is collecting 1% of the mortgage amount. So it's a $600,000 mortgage. They're going to check six grand. They're split with the fraud company. I mean, you do enough of them. But There's, you can make money out of it. Once they catch it, isn't that very easy to look back and go, these are all the loans we gave out that used this verification from this company and this was the realtor on the buying side? Like, It's pretty clear, but then I guess it goes back to what we were saying before. Is like, Unless one of them doesn't make their payment, then they're just not looking into it. Is that where we're at with this? Well, there's no ability to get the police interested. I mean, the um, that the realtor would be flagged for the rest of their lives. They'll never yeah. be able, if they're, if, they're, if they're seen on a purchase agreement, they're never going to get, they're never, their clients are never going to get a bank mortgage again. I mean, there, there's a lot of flagging goes on, but yeah. typically what a brokerage does, a big real estate, because these are typically big brokerages, they'll set some newbie guy up for, as the fall guy, and that'll be the agent who's involved. And then mm-hmm. he'll become known to the bank. So he can't, he's of no use anymore. So yeah, you're fired. Get out of here. Go work for another brokerage and, you know, on to the next. So, um, Let's go back to CRA for one second. Again, I know I saw you tweet about this and you said, like, I'm not an anonymous account. <laughs> Me saying things about them probably maybe won't be a, the best thing ever, but it is what it is. And uh, 66, I weigh 325 pounds. I mean, I, I got the expiry date, right? So I, I can say a few things. Okay. So why can't the CRA verify the income from the mortgage broker? Why hasn't that system be set up? Couldn't that not solve, but very much help this? Isn't that just no, such it, a it, simple answer? It is the solution. It's, a, yeah. it's an obvious solution. It's used in the United States. The IRS verifies uh, documents in the United States, has for over a decade. Uh, and it works perfectly. Um, it's basically foolproof. Uh, they just choose not to do it. Like we've been fighting for it. I personally have been fighting for it for about seven years. Testified before parliamentary committees, uh, put everything out into social media, done everything in the world that I could do to tell these crazy people at CRA to do this. 
Um, their position is, well, we've looked into it. It's doable. We've even established what it would cost as a budget, but we're too busy right now. With mm -hmm. what were they busy? What else are they busy with? <laughs> Whatever the fuck they're busy with, like collecting <laughs> on vehicle expenses, going after people for working from their yeah. homes, cutting whatever the hell their campaign is of the of the order. They're, uh, they're busy. clawing back that CERB right now. Yeah, they're, they're clawing, clawing back, back that CERB in a big way. Busy, busy with that stuff. But mortgage fraud, no, nah. no, nah, we're not. It doesn't make us money. Doing this doesn't make us any money. So it's a low priority. Now, you would think that the actual government of the country would knowing that this mortgage fraud exists knowing that it's detrimental to it's it's ridiculously unfair to people who are not doing it like it, it's so ridiculous that you can't you're some young young couple who wants to buy a house you can't qualify but anybody who's tied into these rings can do whatever the hell they want okay um it's ridiculously unfair it's illegal it encourages lawlessness it's literally ridiculous that this is going on where there is a solution that would solve for between 85 and 90 percent of all occurrences and it's a it's not a big deal about spilling privacy because first of all they've given the documents already inside the release that i here's my documents and I've, i agree you can check them out as if uh, whatever you want i'm signing your authority to do so and we're not asking to look at people's tax returns. By the way, mortgage brokers will never do this. This is only for lenders. It's only for okay. credit unions, banks, huge lenders. We are not going to be the people doing this. Okay. Uh, so the lender says, okay, great. We'll take your number, one single number, line 15,000 from a notice of assessment. We're going to ask CRE to verify that number is true or false. That's it. That's all we're going to do. One number. We don't care anything about your return. We don't care any of the details of your return. We're not going to look at your return. We're just going to ask them for one confirmation of one single number. Yes or no. Red light, green light. That's it. Mm. So that is not a pri in any way, shape, or form is that privacy infringement. Not at all. Okay. That's all we're asking. But they are they have other priorities. That's it. And I'd say from the, um, you know, when you go down the rabbit hole on the internet, you got the conspiracy people that would hear this whole conversation we're having and go, oh, it's actually worse than we thought because they know they could solve it and they choose not to, right? So that <laughs> that conversation could go anywhere. Um, I want to talk about renters and people that are not in the market yet. Uh, I saw a video you had done maybe like six months ago now where you're basically saying like, you know, the parents that said like you millennials are lazy and, and get in the market and like it's it's a bunch of crap. It was so much easier to do it 30 years ago. Um, are you finding in your business or how are these people like I know there's a lot of people that listen to this show that are that don't own real estate yet, but they want to or they're thinking about it. Are you seeing anything in a legal, non-mortgage fraud way of people getting into the market and, and starting their way up the ladder? And uh, there's so much going on. This is a long-winded question, but like, what are you seeing? Any advice on that? Simple answer is no. Um, it's still ridiculously hard for young people to yeah. get started on the real estate ladder. Uh, by the way, that video is known uh, as uh, Fuck You Geezer. That is the <laughs> name of that video, Okay. That the video is where uh, these people like me in their 60s and 70s say, you know, it was really hard. It was so hard to get a house. I had to save you and uh, I had to script and save what you young people are eating your goddamn avocado toast <laughs> and you're going on your trips to Cuba. And uh, yeah, that's why you're fucked. And uh, no, I, I saved. I saved and saved. We had 18 percent interest rates. You young bastards don't know anything about that. And my answer to all that is fuck you, geezer. OK, here's why. Uh, when you bought a house, when people bought a house 35 years ago, it was between two and a half, depending on where you lived, it was between two and a half times income and three and a half times income. That was the price of an average home. Average home was two and a half to three and a half times the average income of that Canadian family. Okay, that's the truth. And today it's between, uh, even in, in great cities, considered affordable cities like Edmonton, it's six times. And in places like Vancouver, it's 12 times. And in Toronto, it's nine and a half to 10 times. So it's just a big fuck you geezer, you're wrong, okay? Yeah. Um, it is much, much harder. And by the way, old geezer didn't have to contend with rents that are astronomical as they are in Greater Vancouver and the GTA. That's just the truth. Do you need insurance? The answer to that question is obviously Yes, of course you do. Whether you are a tenant, landlord, or homeowner, 
you need to insure your property and belongings. And when I insure my investment property, personally, I choose Square One. Square One is affordable online insurance for everyone. If you apply for your Square One insurance policy using the link in the description of the show notes, listeners of The Tom Story Show can receive $20 off right now simply by going to square one.ca slash the tom story show square one is no joke i personally use square one for my landlord policy on my investment condo i picked square one because they were easier to work with than other insurance companies and when i had an issue with my previous policy coverage in relation to my stratas coverage square one was the insurance company that came up with a solution for my insurance problem at an affordable rate. Online quotes take less than five minutes with Square One. Get your home insurance quote today at squareone.ca slash the Tom Story Show and save 20 bucks. We had uh, Doug Porter on the show recently, uh, chief economist of BMO. We asked him about the graph that everyone posts of average income versus house prices and how it's just gone like this. And he Obviously. basically... Yeah, exactly. And he was basically like, well, you know, interest rates should be added to that graph to show a few other things. Um, what's your opinion on that? Like, are, are, is there a possibility that things could actually get better here in terms of affordability of real estate? No, without major changes. Okay, okay. so you've got you've got the same problem in, in, uh, in Vancouver. The same problem exists in the GTA uh, and all, all of southwestern Ontario. Um, we have cities that want to subsidize property tax, cities, towns, municipalities, they want to subsidize property tax with development fees. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the Vancouver area has the lowest property tax in North America, okay? The lowest for one of the most expensive cities on the planet of Earth. It also has the lowest property taxes in the city of Vancouver. Oh, and by the way, if you're 55, you don't have to pay at all. The provincial government will pick it up and they'll just get reimbursed when you sell your house. Okay. So that leads to the same problem in, in Toronto. John Tory raised development fees in 2000, in 2021. John Tory, the, mayor, the current mayor before he's caught diddling the secretary, uh, he, um, he uh, raised uh, development fees 98%. What? Like 98%? That's not inflation, dudes. Okay. Yeah. Like, and you know, it just keeps on going. Like every single... They, they have double land transfer tax. And then the new mayor raised the land transfer tax on transactions over two and three million. So it's even higher. So what's happening is the the transaction of buying a new home is like, if you look at a condo in the city of Toronto right now, brand new, if you look at what the real costs are behind that price of that condo, 28% of it is some form of tax development fee, lien, levy, you know, whatever the hell it is. Okay. So if you're buying for 600000 nearly $200,000 of it is going to some form of government, okay? That did not exist 35 years ago. That's crazy talk from 35 years ago. There's no, governments. Here's what governments thought 35 years ago. Municipalities and towns and cities thought 35 years ago. We're going to let people build houses, and they're going to move into the house, and we want to make that affordable, and then they're going to pay property tax forever, and that's how we're going to make revenue in the city. But because politicians are cowards and also shit for brains, they decided, no, it's easier for me to get reelected as a councilman or a mayor if I don't raise property tax. Uh -huh. So I'll just leave, leave it low forever. I'll leave it low forever, ridiculously low. And I'll have secret new, I'll, I'll secretly squeeze new buyers, but I'll pretend that it's coming from the builders. Well, what the fuck builder is going to take a 30% cost of uh, a government cost and say, yeah, I'll take it on my profit. Mm -hmm. uh, no, fuck no, that's never going to happen, okay? So the buyer pays every time, the whole cost. But it's secret, it's unknown, it's hidden. Just like the land transfer tax, like you're mad about a land transfer tax in the GTA, like you're pissed off if you're in Toronto, it's double, triple land transfer tax. You're mad, but you're only mad for the transaction, then you forget about it again, your property tax is low. Right. So it's all these kind of mysterious, secret, crooked systems to put taxes on the wrong people. Like, why are you taxing young people through development fees while the old wrinkly boomers like me, okay, um, they've been just enjoying the, the low property tax for 20 years, but using all the services. 
Like they've been picking up my garbage and plowing my roads for 25 years. Okay. 30 years. And the property, that's a good deal. Okay. But instead you screw, you absolutely fuck over the new home buyer. It doesn't make sense. It's insane, but and because when, it's, it's, it's secret. So nobody cares. And then look at the outcry we had when property taxes did go up this year from a lot of people that have lived in their house for a long time saying like, we knew we were voting for this, but we didn't think it was going to be this bad. So do you think Olivia Chow had her only option was to actually raise the taxes? There's so many opinions on this. We can go whatever way you want to go here. But, you know, she was not in an easy situation. Look, let me give you the only true answer about municipal, provincial, and the federal government. The only true answer is they will not cut spending by one thin dime. Not a penny. You've never, have you ever heard any politician say they're going to cut spending? No, they call it investment now. Like they don't use the word spending. We're, we're going to invest in our people. <laughs> Fuck you. You're just spending more money. Okay, like, what's wrong with you? This is investment bullshit. Spending okay? our money. But that's, but that's the real question, right? The real question of Olivia Chow or Premier Ford or Prime Minister Trudeau is like, it's not about, it's like, when are you going to stop spending? Like, when are you going to, like you're going to bring out a new program. Some of them are decent, but they all cost money or you're going to just, okay. So you're going to increase the amount of people who work for the federal government by 35% in eight years or 30%. Who's paying for that? Like is all, is all of our government services 30% better? I don't think so. Well, the population's grown, but so is digital. Okay. Like why, 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 like every other business has found ways to do more with less, but you don't, you just do more with more. Okay. And do less with more sometimes. Yes. So why don't we ever talk about, you would never hear a politician talk about spending anymore. It's gone. It's absent from every level. Olivia Chow, come on, start talking about having less people in city hall, less spending on bullshit. Okay. Less spending on stupid shit, but you're never going to hear that. So that's a big, big problem in Canada. You're never going to hear that. And one of the reasons why they probably bring this up a lot too is just based on the pure population growth that we've seen in this country and where a lot of people are coming into. Everyone's got their own opinion on this. Like, like let's take a moment. And like, we know there's all these things happening now. There's still the, the mortgage renewals for the next few years, and we'll see how that all plays out. But like, listen, Ron, in 10 years from now, and I've asked a few guests this question, if population even remains close to what we're seeing right now in terms of the immigration coming every year, like we're going to be in a shit show. What's going to happen with prices? What's going to happen with rent? It, well, it, it's unmanageable. Yeah. Like, it, you know, th this government is on its last legs in Ottawa. Um, and once that changes, then people are going to take a closer look at provincial governments. I mean, mm. like, let's face it. Dave Eby in BC is at least trying to do shit. Okay. He's trying. He's throwing ideas yep. out there. He's throwing, like he's trying to he put the stake through the hardest short-term rental, okay? That's going to free up some units. Everybody says, oh, but not enough units. So what? It's a fucking start, okay? Jesus Christ, okay? Like, like, don't be mad at somebody for trying to do something. I mean, he, he was, he's supposed to try to do something. And then when he does something, that all the people who were running Airbnb said, oh, this is evil. Like, you're going to harm the world. No, fuck off. Hotels have been there forever. People can stay in a hotel. Well, I have a dog, so shut the fuck up about your dog, okay? I don't have need to hear about your fucking dog in a hotel. There's the hair. You can take, yeah, I got a big family. Okay, take more hotel rooms. Shut the fuck up about this Airbnb. It's shit. It's just, uh, it's just illegal apartments. Sorry, it's illegal hotel rooms. That's all it is, okay? So he tried something. He's trying something on the upzoning. He's trying to say every place in the province can build more on a single lot, build more units on a single lot. But then the fucking municipalities creep in and say oh but we're gonna have to study that carefully uh, i don't know if you have enough room for laneway home or uh i don't know we have really look at that like so they find ways to slow it down to keep these nimby motherfuckers happy okay but he's trying he's absolutely trying and he gets a lot of flack for it but he's trying i know sometimes the real estate industry doesn't like what he's doing but god damn it like we wanted politicians to take action. Dave Eby's taking action. Let's see what happens. I mean, he's only just started a year. Let's, yeah. see, what he, let's see what happens. Let's see if he does some good. So we, yeah, it's possible to do good. 
We've had uh, his housing minister, Ravi, on the show before when they were just talking about all this. And, and I will say, like, they're actually doing it. They're actually implementing it. We might not like it. Also, Ron, do you have to disclose how many hotels you are currently an investor in for any of our audience? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Like, okay. <laughs> look, I never, I've never stayed in an Airbnb in my life. I like fucking hotels. I like room service. I like people. I, I don't want to clean up shit when I leave. Okay, I want to. I want to like just leave it in a destroyed mess when I leave. I, I, you know, I, I hate Airbnb. Fuck Airbnb. So I mean, like, close them all down. It's fine with me. Now I, I got a lot of people like this. They lose their minds on online when I say that. Like, Social media, people lose their fucking mind. You're a communist! You're a fucking communist! If I buy a little piece of land, I should be able to do whatever I want with it. You're a fucking communist. Oh, do whatever you want with it? You're going to put a cemetery in the backyard, you motherfucker? Okay? Mm -hmm. You're going to build a crematorium in your house? Like, you're going to run a restaurant out of your garage? Like, fuck off. There's zoning, for Christ's sakes. It's an illegal hotel, for the love of God. You know what you're doing. You profited from it. And now the society's caught up with you. Fuck yourself. You're gonna have to lose some money on the sale. That's it. <laughs> I don't. I don't disagree with that sentiment. I'm not a big fan of Airbnb or anybody that thought they were a good investment at all. Um, I do have a question for you. Um, for anybody that is looking for a new mortgage this year, we have um, we've talked about things like bona fide sale clauses before for renegotiation. I think everybody understands now. Uh, or a lot of people understand what a fixed payment variable mortgage is now and the cause, the problems that that's caused. What pitfalls or or um, future problems do you see or what should we be looking out for? If I'm looking for a mortgage this year, what do I need to know or avoid signing up for that's going to look like a good deal now with the lowest rate, but potentially absolutely screw me in the future? So the sale of bonafide, the, the, the number of bonafide sales clause mortgages that are sold in Canada last year was about um, 35 basis points. Like it's just become almost extinct. I mean, people, people know about it. Mortgage brokers have quit selling it. Um, and so that's, you know, sure, pay attention, but that's not a big deal. Um, and in terms of uh, what product to take, okay. So it's a really simple concept. People are saying take variable because you know the rates can the bank canada is going to eventually cut that is true someday the bank of canada will cut the u.s federal reserve will cut uh someday you don't know what the day is and you're also taking a bona fide risk onto you when you take a variable everybody understands that it's it's often it's cheaper even though it's not today so it's just the promise of cheaper in the future at some point where you don't know what that that is and the people who say, well, we also want to take it because we might want to, uh, you know, we might want to sell, we might want to refinance, we might want to do this and that. So a lot of this stuff, we've got to realize something. A lot of this stuff is discussions of mortgage products are driven by investor clients, okay? Like an investor client wants a low penalty. They want a three-month penalty, okay? Does an end user client really want, really, is that a crucial thing for them? like lowest possible penalty. Is that really crucial? Oh, well, yeah, they might want to fix up their basement. They want to do this. Or they might want to do that. Okay, well, they can get a HELOC on a fixed mortgage. And that might be efficient too. Uh, they don't have to break the mortgage. The biggest lie in the mortgage business, and I, I actually have a bounty out on this, a $10,000 guaranteed payment. If any, because mortgage workers say all the time, you should realize that... Um, that uh, 65% of all five-year fixed mortgages, the uh, borrower will break the mortgage by the end of the third year. I've heard that. That's a fucking lie. That's an absolute, uh, there's like an eight-foot-tall alien out of Vancouver who tells this <laughs> fucking lie to everybody, okay? Uh, it is, and I posted it a hundred times. I've challenged every mortgage broker Canada to do this. Give me a letter signed by a bank executive or a major lender executive that says, yes, our experience is, is that on our five-year fixed, 65% break the mortgage by the end of year three. I will pay you $10,000 for any bona fide letter that agrees with that. Because it's a fucking lie, okay? Yeah, if you're a house flipper, you took like probably a HELOC to do the whole thing. I mean, it's just a lie. Think back on your own clients who are not investors. I want you guys to think of your own clients who are not investors. 
are they refinancing and breaking mortgages, not investors, remember? Are they refinancing and breaking mortgages by the end of the third year? I would say the only time I've seen it happen is when I sell them their first condo because they don't stay there as long as the next property they move up to. Um, but they're not even always like right now, they would rather do anything but break that mortgage. They want to take what they've got left, bring it with them, right blend now, and extend Tom, it. But but I'm gonna say by the end by the middle to end of the like around the four year range, I, I wouldn't want to say it's sixty five percent or whatever, but I'm gonna say it's a solid twenty, thirty percent of those people are by the fourth year either moving up. And that's kind of the 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 thing with the penalty is like now you're to save on that penalty, you're kind of stuck with the same institution. You may not be able to look at, at other places. So I don't want to say it's it's that many people are breaking them, but there's a lot of people. And when money was getting cheaper, there was a lot of people refinancing constantly to try and do that. So I do see I do see it happening. And I I do not think anyone should take three year mortgages, Tom Story, including you, but he did anyway. I am a big fan of the five-year product, but I do think people have to be very aware of the potential downside of how big that penalty could be. And so I just don't think they you're, are. You're you're a fan of five-year variable? No, I'm a fan of I'm a fan of I'm a five-year fixed guy. Um okay. Tom has always been a variable guy, and now he locked into a three-year at the absolute oh, worst yeah, time. He, he got so fucked. <laughs> <laughs> but but hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey. <laughs> You know what, though? Of my almost 10 years of owning real estate, I won eight out of the 10 of them. Yes, you're right. The last two years has been not Whatever great. Whatever you have to say to but justify But if I go over my time. whole length of owning real estate mortgages and I did all the math, I still think I'm yeah. ahead and I'm going to stick by that. Um, yeah, but hold on. Like uh, for, the first, for the first eight, you were just sort of pleasantly thinking, okay, yeah, this worked out. I'm good with the math. Everything's fine. But the last two years... Were such a terrifying no yeah. blue yeah. bent over the couch experience <laughs> that it probably out outperformed in pain all of those pleasant eight years. And okay? then I fixed so, in yeah, I at the worst possible time because I took yeah. everybody else's advice and didn't stay on the path that I'd always had. Um, and the, okay, the crazy Sorry. part for that, yeah. Tom, though, with me is I switched to a half fixed portion and then I put on a massive or not a massive. I put on a HELOC the last time I and, and the HELOC actually saved me. Because yes, I've managed to oh, hammer yeah. that thing down, and now the HELOC is zero. When I would have had these big payments and probably just spent more on on vacations in the past. So uh, I mean, if you're a saver, I think a HELOC can be a good thing. But there's then, for instance, people selling HELOCs to people that they know are not going to be savers, and just telling them it's the best thing in the world. So that's why I'm wondering, like, what is the next thing that we really have to look out for if I'm signing a mortgage this year? Okay, so again, forget about the modified sales stuff. There's virtually no offers on that at all. Um, you take a five, if you take a three-year fixed, it's the lowest rate versus not jumping into a five-year. Five-year is a little bit less, but the truth is we know that within a year to 18 months, um, all of these fixed rates will be lower. That's, that's just a fact. I mean, eventually the Bank of Canada, the U.S. Fed cuts, and you know we will see rates not in the twos, no, We'll see some like high ratio rates in, in the high threes, and we'll see a lot of rates in the in the low to mid fours versus the high four, you know, the high fours, low fives we see today. So if you have a shot at getting, if you know in two or three years you're gonna have a shot at getting uh, a four point two nine rate or four point one nine rate, why not just take a three year? So because the variables just but you, you know, you just gotta it's, it's a lot just, higher right now. It's a lot higher. We don't know when it's going to start to come down. It will come down someday, but we don't know the day. Okay, uh, just like just like if you recall, higher fixed rates led the charge on the way up for the Bank of Canada. Mm. They will do the same thing on the way down. Okay, they mm. will they will be ahead of the variable, and it's just that the simple as that. Eventually, the market will stabilize. But look, I really believe this. Um, the vast majority of mortgage products are fairly straightforward. The client has to make a decision between variable and fixed. Our recommendation today is a three-year fixed. It's as simple as that because it's the lower rate. Like a two-year jumps back up. I'm I'm doing conventional three-year fixed today for in some cases as low as four eight nine. Bunch of conventional, not at ratio. Sure. Uh, four eight some sometimes as low as four eight nine. Certainly four nine nine. Tons of five oh nine. Okay. Not mid fives. 
not mid fives on a three year. Okay. So there are low rates available on a, but there's lower rates available on a five, but the last two years of that five, you're going to be wondering why you signed because there's all, you know, you're paying, you are paying 499 or 489, 479, but you're also seeing that you could have had 409. Okay. And that's right. not with like those low rates you're getting right now. Isn't like, we're going to break your legs mortgage company. If you don't pay, like what, what kind of institutions are, are offering they are, right they, are, now? they are the second and third biggest bank account. Really? Hmm. Okay. Yep. Wow. There is a reason to fucking use Butler mortgage. Okay. There is a reason. <laughs> Oh, we're going to we're going to get it plugged at the end. Don't worry. Um, we think people should be reaching out to you and asking questions. Um, do you invest in real estate? Absolutely not. OK. Is there a reason why? I, I could do private mortgages. Right. OK. Better return on that unless. Yeah. And no, no phone calls at one o'clock in the morning saying the toilet's plugged either. So, you know, oh, you could use a management company. Fuck off. Like it, it's just too complicated. OK, like honestly, I mean, if you can make a good return, look. Besides, you know, the ship sailed. I, I should have been very, very focused on uh, investing in real estate in 2010. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what that's what I should have been. <laughs> but you also yeah. know money, right? Like you know the lending side, so that's that's yeah. probably why someone like Tom and I, who are real estate agents, we know the real estate side, right? So it makes a, a ton of sense. Who is investing or who is uh, borrowing private money right now? <laughs> tons, tons of people. I mean, people, uh, you know, this is a precarious moment in time. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard to qualify for a bank mortgage, honestly, like mm -hmm. honestly, like if you're doing it the, the fake way, it's probably pretty easy until you get caught uh, if you get caught, but there's, there's just all kinds of private money going out today because it's hard to pass a stress test. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just hard. It's hard for honest people, even people who make decent incomes, like you guys know, it's. Uh, to buy the average priced home in uh, the Vancouver area, you need an income of about $260,000, family income of $260,000. That isn't everybody, right? I mean, it isn't. So if you, and particularly today, we can see people who run into problems. Like in the GTA, we're having is some issues with appraisals on new construction. You know, you <laughs> bought a year and a half ago, two years ago. It's not appraising. You need some kind of an option to, to manage that problem. Mm -hmm. um, you got. I would tell you next year, there will be all kinds of condos by the end of next year that will not appraise uh, properly. New uh, construction? New con yeah. New construction condos that will not appraise properly, and there's going to be a raft of those to deal with. So there's always a need for private money at some point. I mean, there just always is. Um, you know, hopefully not on new construction. We got this crazy maniac woman in uh, Hamilton um, who was taking doing promissory notes lending on on Burr properties oh you know what gosh. you guys know what Burr is obviously so, yeah she looks like she's destroyed 110 million dollars worth of investors money so you know so can you explain for like got, there's, a guy, there's, a out, there's a guy out in Victoria Greg Martell who's blown through like a 140 million dollars worth of investor money in mortgage broker um so explain it. Sure. What do you want me to explain? Sure. Go ahead. I just, I just, I'm just thinking like, can you explain to somebody that's not familiar with this? If you can't qualify for a 5% mortgage stress tested at 7%, let everybody know why they could go to a nine, 10 or 14 or 15% private money. And then that deal makes sense because everybody's thinking, well, if I can't, if I can't qualify at 7%, how can I afford to pay 14%? Well, the 14% in the same vein as your HELOC issue is all interest only. You're not paying any averages. You're not advertising any of the mortgage. Mm -hmm. So your payment is lower by nature. Because if you've got a 25-year, 30-year amortization versus interest only, even if it's 9%, it's actually a lower payment than the five point whatever. Okay? Uh, and also, the only thing that typically, typically the only thing that private investors are really focused on is the equity in the property. If you got 35% down, I'm on, let's go. Let's, uh, you know, we're doing a current appraisal. We're doing careful appraising and you've got 35% down on today's value. So we're happy to do it for nine plus whatever. Um, and if you want to do it, we'll do it. So by the way, it's not a huge marketplace still. It's always typically for people who have an issue. There's an issue you have to manage. Okay. So uh, like the problems I just outlined, but yeah, there's there's private deals to be done. Absolutely. 
Ron, I got one final question for you, uh, and it's about Twitter. Um, I'm no longer involved in Twitter because there was just too much. There was too much going on, too much negativity. You have thousands of people responding to you. Lots of people love you. Lots of people don't love you. It's You're always going to get that. How do you deal with all that? Because that's so much going on at once. Does it ever block- get to you personally? Does it ever? No, 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 no. So simple. It's so simple. You block the haters. <laughs> yeah. Never going to see them again. Yeah. Never going to see one word. One, if people say one stupid thing to me, I never see them again. They're blocked. I've blocked, you know, I've got, you know, 60 some odd thousand followers on Twitter. No, it's maybe more. It's like, anyway, it's a big number. Uh, I got another 4,000 I blocked. Right. So, got my, I mean, my, you say stupid, you're gone. That's it. My thought with all that is just don't get into an argument with someone that's not using their real name, which I'd say is probably 80% of Twitter anyways. Um, sure. You know, if I don't know who I'm arguing with, I, like what am I, what am I doing this for? Like I, I at least I'm that's me. You're you. You're on there. It's actually you saying it. Um, everyone else that hides behind an account, I'm not too sure what I think about that. Um, final final question. I promise. Was there ever a time where we weren't an angry mortgage podcast, an angry mortgage broker? Were we ever kind of happy? Was there a moment in time through the last thirty years that we decided that we're going to go with the angry stick? Sorry, how, how do how do we decide to go with angry? <laughs> no, no, no. Just was there a moment in time you decided? I'm. I think it's probably a bit of a joke at this point with you, and that's why you named the podcast that. Like, I think we all know that. But was there a moment that you're like, I'm just going to go with this thing, and I'm going to run with this persona online? This is not a persona. <laughs> okay. You can go talk to my staff members. Okay. You can talk to my employees. So is Ron, Ron's really probably really nice and, and calm and gentle like when he's not on on digital, right? When he's not online. And every one of them will look at you and say, are you fucking stupid? Like, he's the fucking maniac. Okay. Like, um, that's what you get. I mean, you, you, this is not a persona. I think I way. think Tom's okay, question I really... Tom's question really should have been, when did you stop being polite uh, and really letting out what happened? Was there ever a time where you were just like, I'm going to protect? Because sure. like, sure. We- uh, sure, of course. Like when you're a, a newbie in any industry, which is a long time ago for me, you're, you know, you're watching your P's and Q's and you're trying to think of the right thing to say. And, and you know, God knows in the last 10 years, people have gotten so much more upset with saying any any direct and aggressive opinion i mean that's just you know like i i was banned i'm a, uh, the band might be ending i was banned from my own association speaking at my own association because i told a guy like on stage you know there's like 400 500 people listening i said like what's wrong with you you're stupid okay so they had to ban me yeah i've been back since but um but yeah, no, I, I, I probably, I was a normal person, I guess, until about 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just started deciding to say, I'll just say whatever I want. And here's the thing. You guys work for yourselves, right? Yeah. Yeah. You don't have any bosses per se. I mean, you don't, you know, you got to wonder. Independent what pre- contractors. So not technically. You, have, you have to toe sort of toe your association line. You can't yeah. lie to people, right? Uh, I don't lie to anybody. I mean, I say some stuff that pisses people off, but I never, I never lie to anybody. Anything I say, and I don't. And you guys don't lie to anybody either. But in reality, couldn't you say whatever you want to say? Really? Couldn't you? I mean, isn't the constraints put around us that? Here's what I learned. I learned this, and I didn't invent this. Like, I'm just a very, very smart digital guy. I was talking to seven or eight years ago. Um, he was, you know, we were having some drinks and. He was drinking more than me. And finally I said, like, what really is, what sort of is the secret of this thing? He says, so here, I'll tell you the secret. If you're a huge, huge company, like a bank or a, or a chain of stores or anything, you you don't want to offend anybody. Yeah. You don't want to offend anybody because they're all your potential clients, right? But there's a famous quote from Michael Jordan is to say, like, why don't you stand up uh, like your other, other basketball players? Why don't you stand up against racism and stand up against you know, a bad behavior and, and take a stand politically. And Michael Jordan's response was, well, Republicans buy sneakers too. I'm like, that's it. So if you're really, really big, you have to worry about what everybody thinks. But this guy, after about the seventh or eighth old fashioned said, you're never going to be Michael Jordan for fuck's sakes. <laughs> you only need, you only need a sliver of the audience to do well, to get leads. Okay. 
well, if, if 80, if 80% hate you, if 20% love you in Canada, yeah. that's 8 million people. Mm. You're going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just say whatever the fuck you want. Okay. And the people who like it will like it. And the people who won't, won't. But if there's enough of the people who like it, it'll work. Yeah. That's it. I think that was a perfect perfect way to end it off. Ron, thank you so much for being here today. I know our audience is really going to appreciate this episode. If you've watched this this far, which I think I, you had my attention every single moment of this. I don't think anyone jumped off this video. Uh, so make sure to throw us a like. Some people jumped off. <laughs> okay. Well, for the percentage that are still here, throw us a like, subscribe to the channel, check out the Angry Mortgage Podcast. You do such an amazing job with it. By the way, the quality and the production level is awesome. And for anyone that's listening nothing to this- with me. Absolutely nothing to do with well, me. Other people do that. I got nothing to do with it. send that compliment to whoever does that. Um, oh. But for anyone le- listening at this point that wants to connect with you or your company on the mortgage side of things directly, what's the best place for them to go? Butler Mortgage. Just Google Butler Mortgage. It's the pages and pages of Butler Mortgage. So there you go. I love it. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. All right. One.